Hello everyone. Today we are going to talk about our joints. When two bones connect with each other, you will have a joint in that region. The term we use for bones connecting with each other is articulation. So when bones articulate, that means they are joining together. Uh, you will have a joint in that region. Now, we have a lot of joints in our body. Some are highly mobile and um, the range of motion uh, in that site would be high. Um, some joints are partially mobile. So the range of motion in this region, um, you will be able to move, but not, um, not too much. And then some joints are immobile where no movement is going to take place in that region. An example of an immobile joint we have are our sutures. The sutures are the joints holding your cranial bones together. So your cranial bones uh, are never going to move uh, because the sutures are an immobile joint. Um, and that's a good thing because your cranial bones are protecting your brain. Some joints that are partially mobile would be your elbow or your um, joints uh, of your um, vertebra bones. So where your vertebra bones connect, um, you actually have a piece of cartilage holding those bones together. Um, if you think about it, we are able to bend, we're able to sway. Um, so we are able to definitely move our back but we're not able to move our back as much as we are able to move our shoulder joint. Therefore, your shoulder joint is highly mobile. You can rotate your shoulder, you can, uh, you can basically raise it, you can lower it, you can uh, extend your arm out. And so definitely you have a higher range of motion when it comes to your shoulder joint. Now, when someone dislocates their bone, that means that uh, their bones um, have popped out of place. That's usually due to a hard blow to this region, like a hard blow to your joint. Um, it could be due to like you got into an accident, um, you fell, um, as I said, like, you know, the hard blow uh, to this region and your bone can pop out of place. Now, um, you, most of the time here, um, individuals dislocating their shoulder joint. So you hear a lot of individuals dislocating their shoulder, but you never hear someone dislocating their cranial bone. And the reason why you don't hear of someone dislocating their cranial bone, well, because the joints there are immobile. And the less mobility you have, the more stable that joint is going to be. So your suture joints are very highly stable versus your shoulder joint uh, where you have a high range of motion and movement, the less stable those joints are going to be. And so therefore, um, the more susceptible you are uh, to injuring uh, those joints. Therefore, we say that the relationship between mobility and stability is an inverse proportional relationship. We can classify our joints based on structure and based on range of motion. Structure, as I said, a joint is basically where you have two bones articulating with each other. Now, structure is going to tell you how those two bones are connected to each other. Are they connected by a piece of fibrous connective tissue? Then we are going to call this joint a fibrous joint. Are the two bones held together by a piece of cartilage? If they are, we're gonna call this joint a cartilaginous joint. Um, if your bones are connected to each other and between the two bones, there is a fluid-filled sac and a fluid-filled cavity. We call this joint a synovial joint. 
depending on the range of motion you're going to get, we use these terms right here. Synarthrosis, or basically synarthrotic joints, are immobile. So they're not going to allow any movement, such as the sutures, the joints holding your cranial bones. If the joints allow slight mobility, and so the range of motion is not that high, we refer to it as amphiarthrosis or amphiarthrotic joints, such as your elbow joint or the joint between your radius and your ulna, the two bones in your forearm. We are able to uh, flex and extend our joint. We're able to rotate our arm and that's about it. Um, if you have free mobility and a high range of motion, we refer to um, those joints, we call them diarthrosis or basically diarthrotic joints, such as your shoulder joint. So your shoulder joint, you're able to definitely move it way more compared to your elbow. And so we call it diarthrosis. Let's take a look at a few examples of our fibrous joints. So one more time, fibrous joints, um, the bones are articulated to one another by a piece of fibrous connective tissue. Some examples of where we have fibrous joints uh, would be gumphosis. Gumphosis is a fibrous joint. And that's the joint that's basically going to um, articulate your teeth to your uh, maxilla bone, which is like your upper jaw bone, known as your maxilla. Uh, so your upper row of your teeth are connected to your maxilla bone. Your lower teeth, your lower row of your teeth are connected to your mandible. So the joint holding your teeth basically to their bony sockets, uh, that joint is known as the gumphosis joint. Gumphosis is synarthrotic, meaning uh, no movement is uh, going to be allowed in this region. Sutures are another example of fibrous joints, and the sutures are basically the joints in between your skull bones. They are also thin arthrotic, so no motion is going to be allowed in this region. Syndesmosis is another fibrous joint, and it's the joint um, in between your forearm bones, so your radius and your ulna, or uh, we have uh, syndesmosis joints uh, holding your tibia and your fibula. Those are your leg bones. Your tibia is what we call uh, your shin bone. So your shin bone and your fibula, um, they are held together by a piece of fibrous connective tissue and we call that joint syndesmosis. And syndesmosis uh, joints are amphiarthrotic, meaning they do um, allow for slight movement. So you are going to have slight movement and that's why for example, here's your radius and your ulna. You can see the fibrous connective tissue right here. You are able to rotate like your arm. So you're able to move your arm and, um, and that's due to having an amphiarthrotic joint. You are going to be able to have some um, slight movement. When you have articulation between two bones and those two bones are held by a piece of cartilage, we call this joint a cartilaginous joint. That piece of cartilage is either hyaline cartilage or fibrocartilage. Example of hyaline cartilage joints um, are your synchondrosis joints. Example would be the piece of cartilage uh, we refer to as our epiphyseal plate or our growth plate. So you can see this piece of cartilage is connecting um, your epiphysis, which is the ends of your bones, to the shaft, which is your diaphysis right here. 
Uh, synchondrosis joints are synarthrotic, meaning no movement, so they are immobile. Another example would be our costochondral joints, so the joints in between your, uh, your ribs and your uh, sternum, so right here. Um, so this piece of cartilage is attaching your rib, which is right there, to your breastbone, which is your sternum right here. Uh, another example of a cartilaginous joint we call symphysis. And uh, symphysis joints um, hold your bones together by a piece of fibrocartilage. So we have a piece of fibrocartilage right here. We call it our pubic symphysis. And that pubic symphysis is uh, holding your two pelvic bones together. Um, pubic symphysis joint is amphiarthrotic, so it allows slight movement. Another example of a fibrocartilage uh, cartilage uh, joint would be the piece of cartilage right here, which we call your intervertebral discs. Those discs are in between your vertebra bones. So that's another um, cartilaginous joint right here. And uh, it is amphiarthrotic. That's why we are able to move our back. We're able to sway right, left. We're able to bend so basically, we're able to um, flex and extend. Otherwise, if it is synarthrotic, if it's immobile, it would be very hard for us to move. Like we are going to have a very stiff back and it would be extremely hard for us to really live that way. Uh, as we age, um, this piece of cartilage right here, um, this disc right here can actually start to uh, get thinner. And the thinner it gets, the more pain an individual is going to face because the thinner it gets, the more the bones are actually going to um, uh, put stress on one another. Um, and definitely it's going to be very painful. Uh, to slow down that process, uh, living a healthy, active uh, life is going to slow down the narrowing and the thinning out of your intervertebral discs. There's another type of joint we have, and uh, that is synovial. Synovial joints are freely mobile, so they are di arthrotic joints. Um, bones that are articulated um, by the, like where you have synovial joints, they are usually separated by a cavity, and that cavity is usually filled with fluid. So right here, you have two pieces of bones. You notice that the bone ends, first of all, they are protected by a piece of cartilage, uh, which we call articular cartilage. That articular cartilage is made out of hyaline cartilage. Having that piece of cartilage um, at the bone ends um, is very important because it's going to prevent the uh, rubbing um, and it's going to prevent friction between your two bones, which is definitely going to be painful if that takes place. Uh, you can see right here that, as I said, with synovial joints, you have a little cavity, and that little, little cavity right here um, is going to be filled with fluid. We call that fluid synovial fluid. Um, you have what's known as an articular capsule, and that capsule is kind of holding the two bones together. So this capsule is made out of two layers. There's a fibrous layer on the outside, um, so it's more superficial. And then there's a deep layer known as the synovial membrane. The outer fibrous layer is actually made out of dense, regular connective tissue, and it helps strengthen your joint and kind of holds it together so that you won't dislocate it unless you put too much stress on it. Or as I said, if you uh, receive a hard blow, then you can dislocate your bone. Uh, this inner 
synovial membrane, this purplish one right here that you see. Um, this is actually the one that's responsible in secreting the synovial fluid. The synovial membrane has a bunch of blood vessels, and what happens is um, the blood gets filtered and only the water and the nutrients within your blood uh, are allowed to pass through or basically get filtered. And that fluid, that nutritious fluid uh, goes ahead and fills that cavity right here. And that nutritious fluid, we call it our synovial fluid. Um, that nutritious fluid is actually going to provide nutrition to your articular cartilage. Cartilage is avascular, but it does contain live cells. But because it's avascular and it doesn't have its own blood supply, um, the cartilage cells, uh, for them to stay alive, they would need nutrition. And so they get their nutrition from the synovial fluid. We also have um, right here, you can have ligaments on top of the fibrous um, layer of the articular capsule. Uh, what is a ligament? A ligament is connective tissue that's basically holds two bones together. So ligaments hold bone, uh, bones together. Tendons hold muscles to bones. So a tendon holds a muscle to a bone, a ligament holds two bones together. Um, and as we said, um, this is basically how a synovial uh, joint would look like. Um, that fluid, as I said right here, that synovial fluid, that's going to be secreted by the synovial membrane. And as we said, that fluid is basically a filtrate of your own blood. That synovial fluid um, is going to lubricate and it's going to nourish uh, the cartilage at the bone ends. Um, it's going to also absorb uh, shocks um, that are going to take place um, whenever you are moving and you're putting stress on your joints. That fluid can actually absorb all of that uh, shock. If we look at this knee joint here together, we would notice that there is a synovial cavity right there filled with synovial fluid. So this type of joint is a synovial joint. It is diarthrotic, meaning it's going to allow a lot of movement. Um, the parts of the articular capsule of the synovial joint, uh, there are two layers, the outer fibrous layer and the inner synovial membrane, which has the blood vessels. Um, and the filtrate of the blood is basically going to be the synovial fluid that's going to uh, fill up the cavity right here. That synovial fluid is going to provide nutrition uh, for the cartilage at the ends of the bones. And um, having that fluid right here in between the bones um, is going to create um, a lubrication layer uh, preventing the bones from rubbing against each other. Uh, you can also see the extra capsular ligaments right here on the outside. Extra capsular meaning uh, that this ligament is on the outside of the articular capsule. Uh, having the extra capsular ligament is actually going to ensure more stability for that joint because it's going to hold the bones together. Uh, you can also see the intracapsular, intra meaning inside. So there are those ligaments that are also holding the bones uh, together. Having uh, that fat pad is a good uh, cushiony layer shock absorber um, it also helps protect the tendons uh, from rubbing against the bones. Uh, a tendon is um, connective tissue that holds the muscle uh, to the bone. Uh, so you can see another part, another feature that also 
uh, prevents bones from rubbing against each other and also prevents the tendons from rubbing against the bones is the bursa. The bursa is a sac that's filled with synovial fluid and it's able to roll and glide as uh, we move. Um, and as you can see, it's going to prevent the bones from rubbing against each other, and it's also going to protect the tendon. Uh, you don't want your tendons to rub against the bones uh, because it's going to start to tear. And if your tendons tear, uh, they will t uh, take a long time to heal because tendons are not, um, they don't carry a lot of blood vessels. Uh, so, uh, therefore, it would take a, a long time for tendons to heal. There's another feature that's also going to uh, protect your bones and prevent them, um, again, from um, rubbing against each other, and that would be a, a disc of cartilage, fibro cartilage, um, and that disc is known as the meniscus. Um, if someone injures uh, their knee joint, what could happen is the ligaments could tear and the meniscus could also uh, be damaged. Uh, sometimes, uh, um, depending on the extent of the injury, surgery would be required to uh, repair it. This image right here shows you the bursa. You can see how the bursa um, is protecting um, the tendons or the ligaments. Tendons are what holds muscles to bones. Ligaments are what hold bone to bone. Um, you can see also that the bursa can wrap itself around the tendon um, and we call it the tendon sheath. So when it wraps itself like so around the tendon, we call it tendon sheath. A sheath means a covering. This image right here kind of shows you how the bursa actually rolls, so it doesn't stay stationary. As we're moving, the bursa rolls uh, to protect, again, um, to protect your bones, to protect your tendons, ligaments. Um, if someone gets bursitis, itis, the suffix itis means inflammation. So bursitis is the inflammation of the bursa. Uh, that's where that bursa sac right here gets inflamed and swollen. It's definitely going to be painful. Um, one reason someone would get bursitis is if you put a lot of pressure on a certain part of your body. So if you put a lot of pressure on your elbow, the most common places to get bursitis um, would be the elbow and the knees. So if you put a lot of pressure on the elbow and the knee, um, those regions uh, could swell up and that would indicate that um, the bursa has uh, been inflamed. Uh, some of the movements um, that we're going to talk about is um, flexion and extension. And you could do uh, flexion and extension with so many different parts of your body. So you can flex and extend your neck, as you can see right here. You can um, flex and extend your arm, you can flex and extend your knees. Um, when you hyper extend, as you can see, hyper means more. So when you hyper extend, that's when you are uh, pushing your head um, backwards. Um, so you are hyper extending it. Extending it would just be um, standing straight and looking ahead of you. Flexing would be, for example, if you're looking down. You can flex and extend your uh, wrist, your hand, uh, as I said, your legs. You can even flex and extend your torso. So when you're bending to pick up something, that would be flexion. When you stand back up, that would be extension. You can definitely hyper extend. If you are pretty flexible, you can definitely hyperextend. Uh, lateral flexion would be when you sway to the right or to the left. That would be lateral flexion. Abduction would be to move um, your arm or your leg, for example, away from your body. So when you're moving um, away from your body, that would be abduction. Adduction would be to bring it closer to your body, so adduction. Um, you can abduct and adduct your arms, your legs. You can even abduct and um, adduct your fingers. So when you um, 
you know, fan out your fingers, that would be abduction. You um, put them back together, that would be adduction. Uh, circumduction, uh, coming from the word like circumference, live a circle. Uh, so circumduction is when you are um, kind of rotating your um, your arm or your leg, and you kind of create that cone shape right here when you are doing that. So circumduction. Rotation, you can rotate your neck um, just like when you're um, looking right, looking left, um, lateral or medial. Lateral is when you are rotating like away from the midline of your body. Medial is when you're bringing it um, towards the midline of your body. So you can also uh, do that with your feet as well. Uh, pronation versus supination. So pronation, as you can see, uh, for example, like when your arm is in that dorsal view right here, when you rotate it so that now your palm is facing forward, that would be supination. Um, Depression and elevation, so you can um, depress and elevate um, your shoulder blades so when you're kind of like shrugging your shoulders. You can definitely depress and elevate your mandible, your lower jaw. So when you're talking or when you're eating, you open and you close your mouth. So again, that's depression and elevation. Um, dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. We basically do that all the time when we are walking. So when you're walking and your toes touch the ground, that would be plantar flexion. When you lift your toes upwards, that would be dorsiflexion. Prone, uh, protraction and retraction. So protract is, for example, when you're um, pushing like your um, your shin, your chin out. Uh, retraction, you're like retracting it inwards. Um, inversion um, and eversion. So inversion, uh, when you invert, like basically when you rotate your heel inwards. So um, try it out. So like um, go ahead and invert um, your heel so that your heel is basically turning medially. So when you turn your heel medially, that would be inversion. When you turn your heel laterally, um, so like to the outside, laterally, that would be eversion. Um, opposition is when you take your thumb and touch all of your other fingers. That would be opposition. The names of the joints uh, basically tell you where the joint is at. Um, so let me kind of give you an example. So when you take a look at this term right here, temporomandibular. Uh, mandibular is your mandible. That's your lower jaw. Um, tempro, that's your temporal bone. Um, so right here, here's your temporal bone, and here is your mandible. So the joint that basically holds your lower jaw uh, to your skull, to your temporal bone of your skull. Um, for example, this one, atlanto-occipital. Occipital is the bone of the back of your head. That's your occipital bone. Atlanto, that's your atlas. That's your first uh, cervical, um, your first basically neck vertebra. So there's a joint holding your skull to your first cervical vertebra. So we call it atlanto occipital. Um, for example, intervertebral. Inter meaning in between. So intervertebral would be the joint in between your vertebra bones. Uh, vertebrocostal, vertebro coming from your vertebra, costal meaning ribs. So it's the joint um, that are holding your ribs to your vertebra. So as you can see, um, basically the names of the joints tells you uh, which bones are going to be articulated together. Another example, uh, sternocostal. Costal meaning rib, sterno is your breastbone. So right here, the joint holding your breastbone to, um, your, um, to your ribs, sternocostal. Most of the joints that we have in our body are synovial joints. So most of them are synovial, and all synovial joints are diarthrotic. So um, we are going to have, like, you know, a range of motion. 
the temporal mandibular joint, uh, or we usually refer to it as the TMJ. Uh, so TMJ stands for temporal mandibular joint. And again, that's the joint that's going to hold your mandible to your temporal bone. Um, and so right here, this joint is a hinge. We refer to it as a hinge joint. Um, and it's, um, it's a synovial joint. Um, you are able to elevate and depress your, your mandible. You're able to glide your mandible. Gliding is when you are moving it side to side. So um, try it out. So you're able to glide your mandible and elevate and depress your mandible. Um, you can see definitely there's a bunch of ligaments that are going to secure the joint right here. So there are a bunch of ligaments. Um, even the ligament name tells you like you know the bones that are going to articulate together um, so right here for example there is that styloid process coming out from your uh, coming out from your skull whenever you see the term process you know that it's going to be uh, a point of attachment uh, where um, ligaments are going to attach where muscles are going to attach like tendons so and usually a process is um, a protruding portion uh, of your bone so it kind of protrudes out so see how like that process right here it's protruding out uh, so this one's called the styloid process and you can see that there's a ligament right here that's kind of holding your styloid process to your mandible and therefore we call it your stylo mandibular ligament stylo because it's attached to the styloid process mandibular because as you can see it's attached to your mandible so even the ligament names um, would tell you where they are located based on their name and you can see right here if we zoom in um, it is um, an, a synovial joint and you have definitely the cartilage um, at the bone ends to prevent any friction uh, between the bones, you're going to have the capsule, you're going to have the synovial fluid. Um, and as I said, the motion or the movements that we could do with our mandible, we could glide it, basically like move it side to side. We can open and close um, our um, mandible. So like we can elevate and depress our mandible. Um, what happens when someone dislocates um, their um, this joint right here what could happen is this part of the mandible basically pops out of place and like enters like right here it goes underneath the zygomatic process uh, it sticks under the zygomatic process and um, you basically can't close your mouth and um, what the doctors could do Basically, they need to push it back in place. So they would push down and backwards so they can basically put it back in place. And once you've gone through one dislocation, you're more susceptible to dislocating um, the same bone more than once. Um, and, and the reason why you're more susceptible to dislocating it more than once is because um, what happened uh, when you got that first, let's say, dislocation, what happens is your ligaments uh, are going to stretch out and they never go back um, to really how they were before. And so therefore, um, the person would be more susceptible to um, getting a re-injury. Uh, a chromioclavicular, so let's break it down. Clavicular is your clavicle, which is your collarbone. Um, a chromio, it's uh, basically part of your uh, shoulder, um, your scapula. So like the part of your scapula, it's known as the acromion. And so the acromioclavicular is basically the joint um, between your collarbone and your uh, and your shoulder blade. So here is your clavicle, here is your collarbone, and here is your shoulder blade. And uh, part of your shoulder blade is called the acromion. And you can see right here, there's a bunch of ligaments known as the acromioclavicular ligaments holding your clavicle to your shoulder blade. Um, glenohumeral 
Uh, gleno is coming from um, this right here, the glenoid cavity. That's the cavity that your humerus, your arm, um, articulates. Uh, so that's the glenoid cavity. Uh, humeral, it's basically your humerus, your arm. So right here, there's a joint. This joint right here, your glenohumeral uh, joint, is um, known as a ball in a socket. The reason why I call it a ball in a socket because the head of the humerus looks like a ball and it enters into the socket right here. Um, the glenoid cavity is basically the socket of your scapula, uh, your shoulder blade. Uh, and you can see a bunch of ligaments that are going to secure those two bones together. You can see the bursa. Here is the bursa right here. And the bursa, again, is going to provide protection. And you can see that it's underneath your bones so that, again, your bones won't rub against the, ten the ligaments. Uh, you can even see the bursa wrapping itself around the tendons, again, protecting the tendons. Um, so this is like, you know, just the bones, kind of they've removed all the ligaments, et cetera, so that you can uh, see it, or they've removed like most of the ligaments so that you can see at least the humerus uh, heads right here. Uh, the elbow joint is another hinge joint. You can definitely flex and extend your elbow, and you can see the extent of ligaments um, that are basically holding all the bones together, holding your radius and your ulna to your humerus, to your arm. Uh, there are a bunch of ligaments that are, again, securing your radius uh, to your ulna. And um, individuals that are double-jointed, by the way, um, their ligaments are more loose compared to everyone else. And so uh, due to the fact that their ligaments are more loose, um, they can, like some individuals, they can pop their, um, their bone out of place and just kind of put it back in. Um, and they are like very flexible. You can definitely work on your flexibility, but again, some individuals are, um, double jointed because they start off with loose uh, ligaments and tendons in the first place. The radiocarpal joint, that's the joint that's basically holding your wrist bones, which are your carpals to your radius, um, the bone in your within your forearm. So the radiocarpal joint, um, again, you're going to have a bunch of ligaments that are kind of holding the bones together. These are the car carpal bones right there. You can even see um, intra um, ligaments that are found on the inside right here, kind of holding the carpal, um, the carpal bones together. Um, your metacarpals, those are your metacarpals. Your metacarpals are basically the bones that make up the palm of your hand. So the bones that make up the palm of your hand are known as metacarpals. So uh, carpo metacarpal joints, uh, those are the joints that are basically holding your wrist bones to the bones of your palm. Uh, this joint is called the carpo metacarpal joint. Um, the names for the joints for your lower limbs, same thing. Uh, based on the name, you can tell where it's at. So if I say tibiofibular, that's the joint holding your tibia, your shin bone, to your fibula bone. Um, if I say um, tarso, metatarsal, tarso are your ankle bones. So your ankle bones are your tarsal bones. Metatarsal are basically the bones that make the, uh, the body of your foot. Uh, so pubic symphysis, that's the joint that holds your two pelvic bones together, pubic symphysis. As you can see, most of our joints are synovial joints, and, and again, any synovial joint is automatically diarthrotic. Uh, so again, most of the joints we have in our body are synovial diarthrotic joints. Um, this is uh, your hip joint is another ball in a socket. So 
We talked about your glenohumeral as a ball in a socket joint. Another one is your hip joint. It's a ball in a socket. So this is your thigh bone, which is your femur. And you can see again, the head of your femur looks um, kind of like a like a like a ball basically, and it's going to fit into um, your pelvic bone right here in this cavity right here um, and therefore we call it ball in a socket joint of course you're going to have uh, a lot of ligaments holding everything together um, this hip joint is a synovial joint it's a diarthrotic joint uh, this image right here shows you the knee joint so here is your patella here is your kneecap um, your tendons, by the way, can also help secure your joints. So not only do ligaments secure your joint, but also tendons. Tendons are the ones, again, as we uh, mentioned earlier, um, the ones that hold your muscles to your bones. So strengthening your tendons is also another good way to stabilize your joint. Um, here is your shin bone, your tibia, and here is the fibula right there. You can see the amount of ligaments that are basically holding um, your um, your uh, tibia to your femur, your uh, femur to your fibula. So all of these again ligaments are kind of securing your knee joint. A knee joint injury is usually caused by um, several things. Uh, one is um, if you run and then change um, your direction like really quickly. So for example, like soccer players, uh, if they're running in one direction and then you go ahead and kind of like switch really quickly, like um, that would cause it. Or if you're running really fast and then you stop right away, that can cause it. Uh, if you get tackled, um, usually from the side or if you get hit from the side, like meaning like you're hitting the side of your knee joint that's usually what causes a knee injury and so a lot of individuals that um, sustain a lot of knee injuries are usually like athletes like football players soccer players etc um, just because of the nature like you know they get tackled a lot or like again they're running really fast and they stop and they change their direction again all of these things can um, leads to a knee injury. And what happens usually is the tibial collateral ligament right here, that ligament that holds the tibia to the femur bone gets torn. Um, the ligaments on the inside right here, those intracapsular ligaments, they get torn. Um, this one right here is known as the anterior because it's on the front. Cruciate, cruciate meaning cross ligament. This is um, this one gets torn. Uh, the reason why it's called cruciate cross because you have one in the front, you have an anterior cruciate, and you have a posterior cruciate. And um, when you overlay them on top of each other, it creates the shape of a cross. So that's why we call them cruciate. Um, if you've ever heard, uh, you know, uh, some of like, you know, the, the football or like soccer players missing a season uh, because they've torn their ACL. Uh, so ACL, basically what they tore is their interior cruciate ligament. Um, and interior cruciate ligament uh, takes a, a while for it to heal. It can't actually heal on its own. Um, the individual would have to get surgery to heal it, uh, to repair it, basically. Uh, what they would do to repair a torn ACL is either get a piece of ligament or tendon from the individual, but from another part of their body, and they would put it uh, there. Or uh, the physician can actually take a piece of ligament from a cadaver, a dead body, and uh, put it there. Uh, they could also, um, when someone uh, injures their knee joint, another thing that actually tears is the meniscus, the uh, fibrocartilage disc. That could also get uh, damaged. Depending on, of course, the, um, the injury, like uh, how bad is it, um, another thing they could do is they could put like a metal plate. Um, usually a titanium. Usually they use titanium because it's not going to rust inside of your body. So they could actually put like metal plates if um, the injury was pretty bad. 
Um, this image right here, I wanted to show you the posterior cruciate ligament. So this is the posterior view. This is the back of view of your knee joint. So right here. Um, so you have this posterior one on the back, and then there is the anterior. And when you overlay them, they kind of create that cross look. And so that's why we call them um, cruciate. So this would be the PCL, um, the posterior cruciate. And then, of course, we already saw the one on the front, which is the ACL.